Good afternoon. This is Doug Loud talking for Otis and Mandy with what we call part three of the gold talk, although a number of the things I'm going to talk about today apply to almost all mining situations. If you're new to this business, you're hearing a lot of mysterious comments and talking points, and you're not always sure what they're talking about. So this talk is to discuss some of those and try to explain them so you'll understand. Today, we're going to be talking about things like concentrates and dore and infrastructure and metallurgy, cutoff grades, financial backgrounds and things like that, because those become important points as you get further and further into understanding of what happens with mining companies. One of the really important things to pay attention to, in my opinion, when dealing with a gold company or gold and silver companies is are they gonna be producing concentrate or dore? In simple terms, dores are um, uh, looks like a big silver loaf of bread, mostly gold, a little bit of silver, um, where they grind up the rock, uh, produce the uh, amount of gold they want to produce, pour it into a mold, a big high molten heat, and it comes out looking like this silver loaf of bread. And off it goes ultimately to the buyer, straight out the door. Concentrate, on the other hand, and a number of metals are produced that way, they grind up the ore and try to get a high level of the valuable product into what looks like a large bag of dirt. The big truck comes and takes away these bags of concentrate to a smelter, which can be quite a distance away. The smelter then smelts down the rock and gets out the valuable gold, silver, whatever, and sends the mining company a check. Now, the reason this is worth some attention is that, in my opinion, it takes a special master's of business administration degree to understand how to deal with the smelter. Because the smelter pays the mining company a sort of a rolling price of the value of the commodity being smelted, less the value of any bad things they might find in there that they don't like, like arsenic, chromium, whatever, that sort of a thing. It is based on, as I say, a rolling price of, of the metal, but it's also based on the rolling price of the currency. Gold, for example, is ordinarily traded in US dollars. Uh, ordinarily, this doesn't matter, but every once in a while, a bad thing can happen. And one time I saw a currency rate uh, go one way and the commodity price go the other. And our friendly company, instead of getting a check from the smelter, got a bill for $19 million. It's one of the reasons they try to make Doré these days. The buyers just want the Doré bars and off they go with them. So you want to pay attention to whether or not they're going to be producing Doré or concentrate. Now, with a gold company, it gets a little be a little bit trickier because you also are going to hear about sulfide and oxide, and they need to get the rock to be oxide style rock to make a doré bar out of it. Otherwise, they if it's sulfide, ordinarily they have to make a concentrate unless they're going to roast or in some other way treat the concentrate so they can make a doré bar out of it. Let's touch on infrastructure. You'll hear questions about infrastructure, but infrastructure is really important. And it usually breaks down into three really obvious, simple sort of things. Water, power, roads. Because as you'll discover, if you don't already have noticed, mining companies have a way of being out in the middle of literally nowhere. Um, a mine uses a lot of water. When you hear about mining projects in the mountains of Chile, in the Atacama, uh, that's a desert. Uh, when I was there, I stupidly noticed that a street was all shiny and said, gee, look, it just rained. And the woman looked at me and said, no, Mr. Loud, um, they have varnished the street to keep the dust down. It actually hasn't rained here in 10 years. So getting water for those mining projects requires that they find water down in low-level aquifers, sometimes convert seawater to pump it up into the mountains to 14,000 feet to process in the mountain, or if they've lucky, they found a, a lake nearby or something they can use for their water. Water is a key item. In other places, it can be a problem. You've probably heard about lots of mines that were shut down for a while and basically flooded. And then they pump out the water and go back to mining it and they keep very often recycle that water. Power is another issue. Many mines, one of their have a large cost base in the diesel fuel to run generators to produce the electricity they need to run the mine. You'll hear about, oh, well, we're near the grid. You want to pay attention to how close they are to the grid. 
A number of projects these days are right close to a, an extension of the Canadian grid that's being built up to the mining companies to help them. Um, and then you'll hear that, well, they're gonna run an extension out to that grid. And very often it'll be an extension that's only say 100 kilometers long. Sounds terrible to me being a New Yorker because we can't even build a two mile subway tunnel, but they, in the mining space, they're quite accustomed to doing this sort of thing. Um, last but not least is roads. Why are roads important? Because this mining business lives basically on trucks that drive in and out delivering things, um, including taking away um, our concentrate or our doré as we were speaking of it a minute ago. In fact, one of the tricky things to notice is if you're using concentrate is if the truck is late on the last day of the month, they can't book the sale until the truck leaves, which means it might go over the end of the month and that month's numbers could be down. So you want to keep an eye on that if you can. Um, but roads are important. You want to know what their status is. Now we come to something called metallurgy. That's the, the big word for how do you get the metal out, in this case, the gold. They're going to talk about that ultimately, and you'll hear comments like, well, you know, we, we've shown that we can get 70% um, of the metal out or 94% of the metal out using different kinds of metallurgical treatment. You want to hear about that. You want to pay attention to that because after all, one of the ways mines often don't work is they get all that ore up there and they can't get the metal out. Um, you don't care about it today, but in a nickel mine, it matters if it's a laterite mine or not, because it's much harder to get the nickel out of laterite uh, than it is out of its other sources. Now we come to my all-time favorite, the cutoff grade. You'll hear about this, and, and what they're talking about is basically what percentage metal has to be in the ore they're mining to make it profitable. And so they'll say, well, we can um, get away with a 5% cutoff grade in our open pit or our underground mine and the ore it's producing and still be making a profit. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was at the PDAC, which is a big mining conference they have every year in Toronto, um, I dropped by the bookstore and asked one of my favorite questions, which is what was their best selling book? And that year, as the year before, the best selling book was how to calculate cutoff grade. Why? Because Let's say we have a hypothetical mine whose cutoff grade is 5% at $1,500 gold. Well, if gold goes to 1,800 or even 2,000, then we can mine the mines ore at a lower cutoff grade. So then we'll let's say go to 2.5% instead of 5% or whatever the number is. What does that mean? Well, all of a sudden now you have more ounces in the mine that you can mine. Your reserve numbers can now go up. So instead of only having say a million ounces, gee, now maybe you have a million and a half ounces. And that sounds great. Um, and you wanna pay attention to that because some companies maintain the same constant cutoff grade for their calculations and others move them around for perfectly honorable reasons. You just wanna know about it, especially if they're also telling you how many ounces of gold there is per share of stock, which is another important uh, number to keep track of. Last but not least, um, you need to be aware a little bit of how mining accounting works, which is a fascinating subject in itself. But one of the things that happens, as you've probably been hearing, is that the big companies couldn't afford to explore all the time. So they lend out their properties to the little companies, the juniors as they're called, and they can go spend other people's money to do the exploration. If they find a good site, a good project, then the big companies come in and buy them. In fact, many exploration companies exist solely for that purpose. What I refer to as find something wonderful, de-risk it and get eaten. Now, one of the things that happens when you do that is, let's say for the sake of argument that widget mining is bought by big company and widget mining is paid roughly $50 per ounce of gold in the ground as they calculate it. That sounds like a good price to them and they're happy, but big company is happy too because big companies market cap is much larger than the little companies. And so its ounces in the ground are worth, let's say $600. So overnight by the magic of modern accounting, little company got eaten by big company and its ounces went from $50 an ounce in the ground to $600 an ounce in the ground. And now the assets of the big company look even better. Um, a lot of people, people say, feel safe buying the bigger companies, but very often they're buying assets they're never going to mine because they have to keep their asset 
base up so that they have these $600 an ounces to keep track of. I know this has all been a lot for you this afternoon. Sorry about that, but these are complicated issues you have to pay attention to. And I thank all of you for your time and trouble listening to us this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Make it a great day.